Hello everyone, we're here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory for the 86th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. The topic of this year's symposium is Genome Stability and Integrity. My name is Peter Sherwood, I'm a molecular biologist, and I'm joined today by Carlene Simprich, who is professor and head of laboratory in the Department of Chemical Systems and Bi Chemical and Systems Biology at Stanford yep. University. That's right. Uh, Carlene uh, discussed her work uh, earlier this week during the symposium, but I'm delighted to have her here today uh, to continue the discussion. Welcome, Carlene. Thank you. Thanks for okay. having me. Uh, maybe we can start, and uh, let me ask you to just give a, a brief introduction uh, about your work, and then later we'll discuss your current findings. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my, my lab has always been interested in understanding, you know, how the cell responds to DNA damage. Um, and um, we had studied how the cell senses DNA damage and turns on the signaling pathways that help respond to it. But at some point, we started to wonder um, what was causing damage in cells naturally. At, for a long time, we were doing things like just hitting cells with high doses of drugs to induce damage and then study the responses. But we started thinking, well, what pathways in the cell suppress damage naturally. Right, what are the endogenous yes. sources of? of what are the endogenous thing? sources? So we did a, a, an siRNA screen, this was quite a few years ago now, um, knocked down everything in the genome and asked what, uh, what pathways when lost lead to more DNA damage. And we were monitoring a protein called H2AX, which is a marker of damage. And we found something surprising at that point, and that was that, well, a lot of genes that we expected came up, and those were genes involved in DNA replication and DNA repair. What we were surprised to find were all these RNA processing genes coming up as causing damage when knocked down. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of a head scratcher, to be honest, for a while. Um, and it took us a while to realize it. Um, but what we ultimately figured out is that the loss of these RNA processing pathways pathways that are usually um, involved in splicing, for example, or uh, the transport of RNAs, for example, out of the nucleus, um, the loss of those was leading to the formation of what we call an R-loop structure. Mm -hmm. And that's a structure that forms kind of co-transcriptionally when the RNA um, is being made and it reanneals to the DNA to form an RNA-DNA hybrid and then it displaces a stretch of, of single-stranded DNA. Sure. So it turned out the R loops were forming in these scenarios where we were seeing damage, and they were leading to, to DNA damage. So maybe m more R loop formation than normally occurs. Right. In the, okay. or, or, I mean, we really don't know if it's more or well, they're more the persistent. places where they are different okay. or they're more persistent. Okay. You know, I think that's one of the things we're still sort of trying to fully understand. Okay. And part of the reason that's interesting is that these R-loop structures are actually present throughout the genome normally, and they have normal functions in cells. They're sure. important for regulating transcription. So they're there, and they're not causing a problem under most conditions. Mm -hmm. Somehow the cell can manage them and resolve them, right. but under these certain conditions in which these RNA processing genes and lots of other things now that we've found and other labs have found, when those are altered, um, you start to see damage uh, oh, oh, happen. See. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so then we started asking, you know, how do you get the damage? Um, uh, in the context of, of our loop formation, how do you get double strand breaks out of out of uh, these um, scenarios? Mm -hmm. And um, we ended up finding um, a, a few nucleases that actually seem to cut the R loop structures. Okay. Okay. Um, XPF and XPG. Okay. And those normally they would be repaired, but in this case they're cut and maybe not repaired. Yeah, I think I think the um, th they they may be cut and repaired, but we've overwhelmed the cell such that it can't keep up. Okay. Um, or they're not cut. Maybe there is something. You know, I think that's the question. Are is this is this uh, processing is still kind of a question? Is it a normal thing? Um, mm. Is it a repair pathway that's just simply overwhelmed when we? you know, induce so many R loops, okay. um, or is it something that's happening out of context? Okay. Um, yeah. 
and I know that you focused on uh, Senna Taxin and Breca One, so maybe you can tell me how you got into those uh, experiments. Yeah, yeah. So Senna Taxin um, and Breca One uh, are both two protein, two different proteins that have been reported to suppress R loop formation. So that when you get rid of them, you get more R loops in cells and you get more DNA damage. And so, um, oh, do they come out of your screen? Um, they, you know, I haven't even gone back and looked. <laughs> that's okay. actually that's because it was known you used them as a tool to generate yes. R loop formation, but they may or may not have been they, in your yeah, screen. Yeah, okay. I mean, we used other things for a long time, but yeah. more recently, Senataxin and BRCA one have come up in the literature okay, right. from okay. other people's labs, and they're interesting because BRCA one is mutated in hereditary breast and ovarian mm -hmm. cancer, mm -hmm. and Senataxin is is mutated in. Um, a disorder called AOA2 ataxia with ocular motor apraxia. Um, okay. and, and so they had a sort of disease um, connection that made us intrigued by them and their links to our loops. You know, we wondered if perhaps um, there might be our loops in people who have mutations in, in these different genes. Right. Um, and so we. Um, yeah, we kind of use them as tools to mm -hmm. try and study R loop biology right. in the R loop processing pathway. Right. right. Yeah. Um, one thing that you mentioned in your talk was that R loop formation, there's, what, you talked about converging transcription um, units, let's say. Yeah. What was it that you said was the situation there with R loop formation when you have polymerases coming towards each other versus not? Right. So, um, so we had done, um, just to sort of put a little background on that, we had, um, what we found is that when these R loops are induced, um, there, there are hybrids getting cut out okay. of, the, of the genome. And we're, we saw them um, accumulating in the cytoplasm of the cells. And that was a big surprise that right. these things were, were building up in the absence of Cenotaxin and the absence of BRCA1. These hybrids were now not part of the genome where the R loop normally forms, but they're now in the cytoplasm. That was a big surprise. That was a big surprise. No one's yeah. ever seen that before, <laughs> folks. Okay. It took us a while to convince ourselves, <laughs> but, but part of convincing it was sequencing it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also finding out reasons, well, reasons in the genome where... Right, sequencing yeah. it and mapping it back to where it was in the genome. Right. And we did that in the absence of cenotaxin. Mm -hmm. And when we looked in the genome at where they were coming from in the absence of cenotaxin, what we found is they seem to be places, um, or at least enriched in places, where RNA polymerases converge upon each other. Ah, right. Um, and so, it's certainly just a working model at this point, but mm -hmm. our thinking is that cenotaxin may have a function in dealing with problems as RNA polymerases converge. Sure. And it probably sure. at certain sequences as well that are part of those converging polymerases. Right, because uh, certainly there's different, there's increased, a certain kind of supercoiling when you have that happening that yeah. helicases deal with, and if there's more, then they, there's more helicase activity that may be involved. It could be the mm -hmm. supercoiling, um, it could be secondary structures mm -hmm. that are forming in okay. the RNA or in the DNA or mm -hmm. in the hybrids. Mm -hmm. Um, that cenotaxin's helping to resolve and unwind. Um, I think we don't, we really don't know at this okay. point, you okay. know. And then BRCA1 was a, a similar story, or what, did it have some differences, or? So we haven't yet sequenced the BRCA1. Okay, That's great. next on the list. Okay, okay great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, well, what do you, so in addition to that, what do you think some of your other next steps for the future will be? Uh, to, well, first of all, we have to address how these hybrids are getting, getting to the cytoplasm. How they get out of the and cytoplasm. Why, and well, yeah. why, or into and the cytoplasm. are they doing anything there? Yeah, no. Or are I, they just um, byproducts? It, right, Okay. yeah, we wanna know how they get to the cytoplasm. We wanna understand if, if this is um, a pathological effect or a kind of repair pathway, perhaps, for our loops. Um, we, we obviously mm -hmm. wanna sequence the BRCA ones and more things, because I think we wanna know whether our, our hypothesis is that these hybrids uh, are, are in the cytoplasm reflect places in the genome where the gene that we knock down to make them is working. I so see. our model is that they're gonna be different when we get rid of BRCA, I see, because yeah. BRCA probably works on some other kind of problem right. at our loops. And right, right, right. 
we knock down another RNA processing gene or a gene that is suppressing our loops, we may get yet another right. kind a different of pattern. subset of, of yeah. We may not see there. the converging polymerases. We may right. see something totally different, okay. or maybe we'll see right. something the same. So I think uh -huh. that's one of the yeah. things we want to look at. And then we also um, notice that these things activate the innate immune response. Okay. Um, and so that is another area that we're interested in understanding. You know. Um, they, they turn on this response, so if they're f happening in certain disease conditions, um, that activation of that response could be part of the pathology of, of the disease and some of the phenotypes, and so we're, we're interested in trying to understand that as well. Oh, great, great. Well, if there's anything else you'd like to add, or if not, then thank you for joining us, and it was oh, a pleasure to have you. Thanks, yeah. thanks, yeah, thanks for having me. Yep. Yep.